not a very good teacher. I'm supposed to do it, and then you're supposed to do it. Is what's supposed to happen. But I, I don't have that teacher. I don't have that teacher vibe. I just, it's not a part of who I am. I feel like I'm a m million miles away. Oh, I'm probably moving on the camera, people. I found out uh, from Topanga one day that you have a better side. I didn't know this. I always wondered why she was always facing the same way in photos. She says a better side. The problem is I got to go like this. Right? What's your What's your camera side? They They said uh, we there's a radio station from where we came from, a uh, Lutheran radio station. So we'd be on there, and we always joked about how all of us pastors had faces for radio. And it was true. Yeah, right. Sit, <laughs> sitting around the table, we all agreed with each other, too. We were like, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, so we're in the last part of the Apostles' Creed. You should have the Christian faith and life, the third article, Apostles' Creed, part three. Okay? Um, we've been going through this work of the Holy Spirit and the church. And so today our topic is going to be uh, very much on the church triumphant um, as, we, as we look at that, uh, that a part of it. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. What is judgment? The last day. The last day, right? Nobody knows, right? What will it look like, right? Uh, I reference on there that there's all kinds of books and movies out there. I've never seen the, and I've never read, uh, you know, Tim LaHaye's big series. I don't know how many books are there. Anybody know? How many books are there? It's like seven. It's like seven or something like that. Yeah. Be the yeah right. Probably did it on purpose. Right. Uh, I've never seen the movie. I've never watched or read the books. Uh, but they've grossed millions of dollars, uh, which goes to show that people are are infatuated with this stuff. I mean, they just really get into the end time stuff. You see it a lot uh, in many Bible studies. Uh, I even got asked here recently if we would do. Uh, a Revelation Bible study, and uh, I'm always like, yeah, we can, but I don't want to, all right? Uh, we, we, we can, but I don't want to, right? Uh, but the, the last day, you know, what we know about it is that it's, uh, everything's taken care of by the Lord. He knows when it's coming. You know, we're going to talk about this more as we go through it. It's really actually not for us to worry about, just to always be ready for. That's, and that's where we get mixed up, because what do people like to do? We like to worry. You know? And sad to say, uh, sim scriptural symbolic language often creates worry where God has given to us to, to create trust, to hope, to have hope. But it often creates worry. And it's not, that's not the intent of revelation. When John gets that revelation on the Isle of Patmos, it's supposed to be comfort to the church, not worry, right? Um, uh, yeah. All right. Off to the right-hand column in the box. What is the third article? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? This is most certainly true. All right, here we go. We gotta start really low because it's got a big range in it. Wake all, wake, for night is flying. The watchmen on the heights are crying. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight is the welcome call of voices. And at the thrilling cry rejoices, Oh, where are ye, ye virgins wise? The bridegroom comes awake, 
son of about 40 at my funeral. Uh, hey, uh, it'll be a, a hymn sing, I think, at my, my funeral. So be thou prepared if I pass before you. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the plans. Uh, no, actually, there's you know, all those hymns, those triumphant, uh, church triumphant and all those hymns, such great. Oh, I mean, in that, in that, in that, and that's, that's how we should see Revelation right there. I mean, look at those words that are in there. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the, the, we're there greeting the bridegroom, you know, the blessed one, uh, hail Hosanna. That's how we see the, the last day. I put a couple cemeteries there, uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Anybody been there, by the way? Yeah. yeah. I've only, when I went there for a tour one time when I was a nurse in the, in the Army, we went there. Uh, you know, they're getting ready to do the, there's a nurse's uh, memorial there at the, at the mall. Uh, and they were putting all that together, and I got to go there as a tour. We only went by Arlington. Our schedule didn't have us going into Arlington. So I've always missed the fact I didn't go into Arlington, right? Uh, but then there's the Normandy American Cemetery there also as well. And I put those down because, you know, you got to ask yourself, you know, why, you know, you look at our, our graves and stuff like that. Why do we do in burial what we do, you know, as, as people, and maybe as specifically as Christians? Why do, why do we do that? Why do we, first of all, why do we bury our dead? Out of respect. Yes, we do it that way. But I'll go back to, we bury our dead for the living to keep us healthy. You put their corpses in, in the ground so that they don't cause a mess. Exactly. I mean, we bury, our dead for the, we bury our dead for the living. That's why we bury them. Now, why do we bury them the way that we do? There you go, out of respect, and very specifically out of respect for what? And whose body? Christ's body. That's exactly right. We do it out of respect because, I mean, we are going to be glorified like his body is glorified. So the way we see him come from the grave, we will come. This is why I love going to these big cemeteries and standing there, and then I, want, I read Ezekiel 37. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and I, you, know, I, I, you wish that. I don't know how it's going to play out, obviously, in the last day, but I would, would love to be at a cemetery on the last day, you know, and <laughs> right? And how are they lined up? That's why I love going to the cemetery. I mean, it looks like, I mean, have you ever been anywhere, like we used to do uh, military parades, specifically if you have like these big dignitaries coming to town, and they would have fields full of soldiers. I mean, fields full of these soldiers, right? And that's what it's going to be like. Woo! They're all up, bursting forward, you know, and they're all lined up, you know, and there's the saints, glorious. No, I mean, there's nothing in the scripture that says that, you, you know, you cremated or what. Remember that the burial changes have changed, burial practices have changed over time uh, with the culture, not really according to like what God said. Now, a lot of times, why, you know, there for a while, by the way, even in the Lutheran church, you were not supposed to have a cremation, right? You know, that language has, that has toned down quite a bit. But why, why were we against cremation? Yeah, it just, it's on, in other words, it's, you take care of the body. You know, it's much like what they do with Jesus. They put him in the tomb. Or think of Joseph, right? Uh, remember, they took care of his body as well. They were going to make sure that it was taken back to the fathers. And remember, in the days of Jesus, how they took care of bodies. And, we, and by the way, we found, we, we believe they found the bones of Jesus' brother James. This was uh, several years ago. An estuary showed up, a stone estuary, which is a stone box. And it said, James, the brother of Jesus, on it. And you open the box, and guess what's in there? Only. Bones. Bone. Only the bones. See, what they used to do is they would take the, the, let the body decay. They would use a tomb over and over again. Let the body decay. Then they go in and they clean all the flesh off. And I have no idea, by the way, don't ask me what they did with it. They would only keep the bones, you know, after they had dried up. I mean, they were all dried up, you know. They'd only keep the bones. they take the bones. Go to the uh, catacombs in Italy. Anybody been there before? Well, right? Yeah, and, you, and think what that catacomb will do on the day that God raises all those. It'll probably explode. Because <laughs> there are thousands of them down there in, that, in those catacombs, right? I mean, it'll just come alive with people that are coming out of the tomb. But they only have the bones. So burial practices, even though the church has gotten hung up in it in times, you know, what do we do, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, you know, really is to, uh, as Christians, we want to make sure we honor the body. It's, it's, it's why we do discourage purposely, like, you know, throwing your ashes all over the place. Besides, if you've ever seen videos of that happen before, you kind of want to watch out for it, especially because Kansas and Nebraska wins. I saw this one one time where these family went out to this cliffside. They were going to dump it off the cliff. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it is funny. And so they dumped this person. They, woof, the wind from the... And all of them were coated now in the ashes of their loved one, right? And, and, you know, I mean, there's just certain things you should discourage just because of good practice, you know. But the body is going to be raised, incorruptible. That, Yeah, they were, those tombs, they couldn't bury them in the ground because right. the ground was soggy. Right. And so they had a, uh, had a name. They put them on this platform thing. But if, if they were, if it was, they would just take that in a year and literally flip it. The bones go. And guess who else is down there? Grandma, grandpa, great aunts and uncles. Your generations are all piled now in the bottom of this thing. And you go up onto the top to await your turn to get dumped into the. So, Jim. Over time, burial practices have changed. You know, you, you, we don't want to. We just want to go with remember. We always try to remember. We do with the body what we do, uh, not because how they were in this world, but because of what Christ has promised with His resurrection. That's that's why we do it. Well, like in Genesis when you got the curse, God said, "From dust you sh you came, but dust shall you return." Mm -hmm. Right. And on the last day, if He made us out of dirt. He's going to make us out of dirt again because that's what Christ yeah, he's going he's to bring that same dirt back, except out of dirt. <laughs> it's like Miracle Grow. <laughs> uh, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, right. Hey, well, you know the, the trend, and, and we are highly advising against this. You can now turn yourself into a potted plant. Have you heard about that? <laughs> yeah, seriously. They compost you. They compost you. And, and by the way, we are, we are against that because that has a anti-religious view that you are just part of the, the world. All right. So we, we are against that idea of turning you into compost, right? Yeah, I have a composter in my yard. Well, I don't have it in my yard yet. You guys just stuff me in there and tumble me every once in a while. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, yeah they, they, some people have been frozen. Cryogenically frozen, right. And, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna, Jesus is going to come back in the resurrection. They're like, well, that was a waste of time. All right, you guys are way off track here. <laughs> All right, let's go to the reading here. Acts 24. Acts 24, uh, 14 to 27. A little bit of a, a longer reading, but we're going to talk about, look at those questions. Why was Paul on trial? How did he react? And, and remember, why does Paul say he's on trial? Not why did they, they put him on trial. Why does Paul say he's on trial? Read through this. Somebody nice and loud, 14 through 27. There will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am in trial before you this day. So Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, took him off, saying, When Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. 
And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment, Peter was alarmed and said, Go away from him. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix brought Paul before him. Yeah. So what is, why is Paul in trial? And it's in verse 21 is the big verse. That's the resurrection. Right. He's on trial because he's preaching about the resurrection. Um, you know, this became a big thing uh, with those who were um, uh, against the, the Christians, uh, you know, from the Sadducees especially, who didn't believe in the resurrection on the last day, right? And they're coming after him. So he's on trial for the, the resurrection, you know. And so this is uh, the same thing that we do. You know, people want to come against us as a church. You know, they, they want to they speak against us and they can say, well, it's, you know, you, you Christians believe in false things or whatever it is. But ultimately, we're talking about eternity. You know, we talk about today, you know, uh, for a little while is the message for today, for a little while. Uh, no, we're not a little while, people. We, we are an, an eternal people. You know, this time in this fallen flesh is a little while. But we are an eternal thing. And when we preach that, the only way that that comes about is through the works of Christ. There's no other way it comes about is through the works of Christ. And so when Christians are persecuted for the sake of Christ, they're really... They are being persecuted for the fact that we do believe that we are eternal people in Christ. We do. And this is what Paul is saying here. You know, he spoke the truth about what was delivered to him because it is about eternal salvation. And he's being put on, being put on trial for it. All right. Now, what does this teach us? Open-ended question. What does it teach us? Your sermon was really powerful this morning, Pastor, mm -hmm. on your Twitter. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, you know... Yeah, that, that time, that time thing. Well, they, you know, I knew it was Graduate Sunday, and I'm looking at the text going, all right, how do we, how do we twist something in here, you know, that uh, you know, still exemplifies the Word of God and, and yet talks about our current situation? And, you know, I thought back when I was going through school how it just seemed like, oh, my gosh, you know. And they hand you a syllabus, and you're like, oh, Lord. There is no way, right? And then you get done, and you're like, oh. Somehow, by the grace of God, we made it through that. Well, that's just a, a small glimpse, people. These, these, these days are fleeting. These days are fleeting. And we, if we don't realize that, and that's why I was going to do a whole sermon on the God of Kronos. I did mention him this morning. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Yeah, Kronos. The God, it, I mean, he's a, a mythical God, but Kronos is from Greek time. Chronology. You know, and so they made, you know, a god. Of course, the Greeks made a god about everything. You know, I mean, they would make whatever was happening. They'd make a god about it, right? Uh, but we actually do worship that god. Not, obviously, like, you know, we make a temple to him. We don't make a temple to him. But we get caught up in it, you know. Uh, we really do. And we start thinking, you know, I have to, I have to, this is this, you know. And, and all these type of things, you know, we, 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 we buy into this. You know, like, uh, and even like, you know, kids going off to college, and I don't want to discourage kids from going to college, but, you know, there for a while, especially we're telling them, you have to. You have to go to college. You have to get a degree. You have to do these things. There's no way you'll be successful in life if you don't. Wrong. You know what you have to do? You have to worship the one true God, and you do have to serve your neighbor. That you have to do. Now, do you have to go to college for that? No. Right? And it's led to a lot of false things that are going out there because we worship time. We're worshiping time, and we're not worshiping the timeless one. Worship the timeless one. Okay? Again, I'm not saying don't go to college. Go to college. Okay. Right. But we get caught up in this too much, and whether we like it or not, we have all worshiped that God called time. We have. Right. To think outside of ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Right. There, there is more to it than, than just us. I'm trying to repeat so everybody can hear what's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, all we're supposed to do, it, it literally, and Jesus makes this point when he talks about the birds of the field. Get up today and, and you know, and you sort of, you know, do this, 
and then you go down, you know, praise your God, start there, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then what are you? Husband, wife, worker, son, daughter, father, mother, da 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 da, da right? And what does God want you to do in that position? I guarantee you, if you just do that during that day, that night you'll be tired, you'll lay down, you'll go to sleep, the next day you'll wake up and you're going to do the same thing. Let's see what your spouse does when you start doing this every morning. You'll realize you're fleshly and you'll go through the same, same thing. That's all we're supposed to do. Now God might say, hey, you know what, I'm going to give you 100 years to do that. Right? By the way, most 100 years are like, God, stop it. Okay? Or God might say, I'm only going to give you five years to do it. God might say, you know what? I'm going to rescue you today, even though you're still in the womb, and I'm going to take you to be with me in paradise now. You know, I mean, and when you, when you think of it that way, it really changes your understanding of, wait a minute, what am I striving for? What am I fighting for? You know, what are all these things that are going on? You know? uh, and, and there would be a lot more peace in the world if all of us would get under the understanding that we're temporal. In this, we're eternal, sorry, we're eternal. This world is temporal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the point of this morning's sermon is that, and, and this is, and I put it this way too, you know, time must obey God. He created it. So therefore, those who are in time must do what? Obey God. You ever have that hard time doing a segue? Well, you have to look at any questions. I know. And I, I apparently don't even know how to wrap up my own open-ended question. Ready? Top of the next page. No, no. My pages are different than yours. Are we on the top of the next page? Okay. Um, what will the return of Christ look like? Um, let's just, again, do this. If you've got it, say its reference and read it out loud. These are so comforting, too. This is so great. That's that. We do that at uh, committals, gravesite. That that verse is read a lot uh, at committals, right? Anybody else got another one out there? I got John five twenty eight through twenty nine. Okay. Do not marvel at this, for now is coming on all who are in the tomb to hear this story, and turn out those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. It says. Uh, it says at the, at the death of Christ, and we read into the Gospels, it says, you know, the, the ground shook, the, the earth, the rocks were split, many tombs were opened, and, and the saints were seen walking through Jerusalem. Can you imagine? <laughs> You're sitting there, all of a sudden, you know, here comes great grandma or something down the, the street, you know? I mean, talk about a freak out moment, you know? You're like, what's going on? Uh, you know, but I, if that was just a little. I mean, just a little preview. And, you know, and God, you think about that, that's such a blessing. God didn't have to do that. I mean, what a, a blessing that is for us to get that little glimpse, you know, get that little preview. That verse always makes me think of that. It makes me think of move on, too. Everybody will be raised. That's coming up. That's the famous C.S. Lewis quote. He's never met a man on earth. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. Right. I forgot about that. Okay. Nice and loud. And and prior, I mean, that's that's Daniel. That's Old Testament talking about it there. Uh, some to, to life, some to, to death. 
We don't want to do that last one, by the way. We're going to talk about it here in a second. Anybody got that First Thessalonians 4.16? Yeah, the dead in Christ will rise first. Yep. We'll be br caught up into the heavens. You know, St. Paul talks about it. We'll be caught up into the heavens, and we will join them uh, together as he talks about this kind of all happening at once. But I love that there because the return of Christ, you know, and they put all these together. One, it's going to be a very fleshly experience, a very fleshly experience. You know, Job talks about that. In my flesh, with my own eyes. You know, this is not a spiritual thing. It's a fleshly thing on that day, Right? The, everybody's going to come bursting forth from their tomb, right? Exactly what that looks like, I don't know. You know, I have my own visions of it. Like I said, I love standing at cemeteries and looking out over all the rows, right, and thinking of that. Everybody coming up, right? They'll all burst forth from the tomb. There's going to be that voice of the archangel and the sound of a trumpet, okay? Uh, that's just going to happen. And you're, I mean, everybody's going to take note. And remember, there's another passage. Too. I didn't put that one in there. There's another passage where it talks about it says, when you hear this, lift up your eyes, therefore. That is only a call to believers. See, two, it's going to be two things are going to happen at once. When the when judgment happens, believers are going to go, you know, we're going to be that lifting up our eyes. Unbelievers are going to be doing what? Yeah, they'll be down in terror. You see the difference, right? Now, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even those that are in terror will still be confessing that Christ is Lord. You are Lord, you are Lord, but to their condemnation. But we will be on our knees, looking up to heaven, confessing him as Savior, right? You are the, the king, right? And there will be that judgment that Daniel 12 talked about, right? That some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Uh, big, long passage. We're not going to read it. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, obviously a great uh, section where Paul talks about these things in more detail. So you can, you can look at that a little bit later, all right? A little bit of focus on what our bodies will be like, Philippians 3.21 and 1 Corinthians 15. Part of that passage, by the way, that we didn't read up above, but we're going to read 42 and 43. When you got them, read them. Yeah, Philippians 3.21. He will transform our lower bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to him even to subject all things to himself. I, it's kind of funny because I've had, uh, you know, people come to me and they'll be like, oh, you know, growing old is so hard, you know. And they always say this to me, don't grow old. <laughs> okay. I'm trying. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? They'll say don't grow old. But I always tell people, wait a minute, you're old. You're broke. All right. You got fake joints. Rejoice. All right. Number one. You wouldn't have gotten that way had you not served. You know, take a new pair of shoes and put them in the box in the closet and never wear them. They're always new. It's true. But they also never serve their function. You served your function. You're wore out. You're tired. Rejoice. But the other thing is it reminds you, what are you going to do with that old, wore out, torn up body? Trade, trade, trade it in. Yeah, right? <laughs> yep. You're gonna, it's going to be planted. Right? That the Lord might bring it forth. Right? You know, and so it's going to be planted. You know, And that's why I say we should do that as we're getting close to the grave. Okay, Lord, it's time to be planted. It's time. Right? It's time to be planted. Right? Because we're looking forward to what? There you go. It's all about the new life. It's about the new life. We're coming back in a glorious body, raised in the power of the Spirit, like Christ's body, glorified. Right? Except we won't bear the marks that He bears, because that was more once for Right, right. Okay, what about those who reject Jesus? We talked about it a little bit. There's a couple more passages. Again, we're not going to look at the Luke one, uh, but they're there for you to look at later on. Isaiah 66, Matthew 10, and Matthew 25.
for their for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an an adherence uh, to all flesh. Okay. By the way, who is the one that can both destroy both bo body and soul? God. God, right. A lot of people think the devil. No, he's got no power like that. Right? Only God can do that. So we fear God. Uh, Nat Matthew 25. Right. You know, so the, the, those who reject uh, Christ are cast away from God. Uh, their body and soul are put into hell, and it is described uh, as a place where the worm eats the flesh, but the flesh doesn't die. All right? Where the fire burns, but it is not destroyed. Right? In other words, it's eternal, it's eternal torment. You know, and this is why you know, we're not harping on somebody <clears throat> to be a Christian. We're actually reaching out to save them from eternal condemnation. <clears throat> and that needs to be our attitude, too. You know, not, not uh, you know, you should do this. No, here is what God has done for you that you don't face these things. Right? This is what God has done for you. And it's often a problem with that evangelism. Requires love. What's that? That requires love right. to do that. Right. And, and, this, and it's often a problem in our evangelism. Is that evangelism seems as if we're trying to shove something down somebody's throat. No, evangelism is about rescuing you from the perils of eternal death. That's what it's about. You know, we, we want people to come to the knowledge of, of salvation and save them from this that we're talking about right here. That's the hope. Nobody has to go through that. We don't even want our enemies to go through that. Right? Which can be a tough thing. Think of that guy that just killed 10 people yesterday. That's a tough thing to not want him to suffer that. But God doesn't want anybody. He wants all sinners to come to repentance and receive his eternal salvation. All sinners. All right? That's an excellent point, you know, that God did not intend that for us. We're not supposed to face that. That is for the devil and his horde that that has been prepared. And that's why, you know, uh, you know the, the saying, misery loves company. All right? Well, there's nobody more miserable than Satan. And that's what he wants, is a company of you all to be with him. Right? That's what he wants. Again, he doesn't power, though, but he is a great tempter. Great, great tempter. Okay. I, think, I think a lot of people get hung up on the imagery of those passages. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it sounds like well, God is just supposed to beat the devil or whatever. Um, not recognizing that, that it's just trying to describe in terms of an understanding of what it would be like to have ab to be absolutely cut off from God completely. Mm -hmm. you know, people in this life don't realize blessed they are that God is involved in the world whether they see it or not mm -hmm. and because it's going to be so much worse when they're completely cut off from his presence in it's eternity because that's what hell is hell is not this, this torture chamber that God's constructed for evil people that's the way we tend to think of it but it's, it's, it's trying to describe in human terms what eternal conscious existence completely cut off from God is going to be like right. and, that, and that's the the sum total of what is hell, the absence of God. And that's why this world may be bad, but it's not hell. Because, whether, again, whether we recognize it or not, he's still involved. He's, he's still, his grace is evident at moment by moment if you, if you look for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you Even know. Even in your darkest moments. And, and this is why, you know, the, the church will persist because God persists. You know, I mean, and that's what he wants. That's what he wants for the, the world. But really, the, the hell is the absence of God, the absolute absence of God. And so anything good, because God is good, is gone, which is why then the, the direct opposite is anything bad. And it's much like look at John's vision of heaven. So go the other direction. The hell is the right. What are the streets made out of heaven? Gold. The gold you can actually <laughs> see through. The gates are what? That you can walk through. Okay? 
right? These, this is image language, people. You know, I mean, it's got how many foundations? Twelve. Twelve, right? This is image language to show its strength, its wealth, you know, of what it is in terms that you know. Everybody knows about pearls and gold and foundations and in terms that you know. Now, if you take start taking this literally, right, like so many Christians want to do, you know, then they, they start getting the symbolic language of Revelation, Daniel, and, and these type of places all out of whack, and they no longer comfort, they only strike fear, right? But that image of, of, of heaven should strike comfort. Now, the image of hell should strike a little bit of fear to me, you know, and then, you know, what do we do when we're afraid? Right, yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, I mean, when, you, when you're afraid, when your kid is afraid, what do they do? Yeah, they, and literally they, you've had that before where they come to you afraid, you know, it's, it's, uh, and they, they sink their head like right in between your legs, you know, and they reach around behind you, and sometimes they get a little too fleshy back there, you know, and they grab on, and they, you know, they're trying to literally bury themselves in you for safety, right? Right? That's us with our Savior. Right? We cling to Him. And guess what you're holding on to? Everlasting life. That's what you're holding on to. And that's why it's good. And that's, what, and that's the work of the law, by the way. What's the law supposed to do? It makes us pump our brakes, right? Even though you were only doing the speed limit, who's guilty of that? You see it? Ooh. Oh, <laughs> I was actually being good. <laughs> You know, it makes us pump our brakes. You know, that's what the law does. It, it gets us in there. The law has a purpose, which is why the law needs to be preached with its sternness, which is why worm doesn't die, flesh doesn't get burned up, you know. If it's, if, and by the way, if there isn't the sternness of the law, there's no sweetness of the gospel. There you go, Romans 5.12. Why do we all got to die? Get the other one. Flip ahead to the. There's a six. Was that five twelve? Six. Yeah. Right. You know, everyone must die because we all are sinners. Right, and there's another passage where it says God subjected us all to this not out of futility, but in order that He might be the Lord and Savior of all. Remember, Adam and Eve were eternal, right? But they were also uh, not believing when they went to that fruit and did what the devil said and, and not what God had asked them to do. Right? They were unbelieving at that point in time, and so God brought them back into faith through the law uh, that came in there. All right, this is another one I love, too. What happens to Christians at death, right? What happens to you when you die? Philippians 1 and Philippians 3. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Timothy 4, Luke. Just read them out. Say, them out, say what they are and then read them out. Anybody do John 17? I got it. Okay. Uh, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me 
before the foundations of the world. Right, right. So immediately we go to be with Christ because our citizenship is in heaven. When we're away from the body at the time of our death, we don't fear because it means we're with the Lord. In other words, they're not, we're not lost, you know, as some would say. We don't know what's happened to them. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's now we're free of all the temptations of evil, that paradise with God, all those things that, that, that worried us, that haunted us, that led us away, all those things are God because we are where Jesus is at this point in time. That happens immediately upon <coughs> your death. <clears throat> So you're talking about uh, entering into eternity, which is something for us temporal creatures is very hard for us to grasp, which is uh, uh, you know one of the reasons probably why we don't delve on it too much. But you're right, um, and I've heard the same thing said before, though we really don't know what all entails when we enter into death. But once you're eternal, uh, you know we, we end this temporal part of our life. Time doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter. The, the saints in heaven, it's very clear about this. They're sitting around the throne saying, how, looking down on earth saying, how long, O Lord, how long? Not, Lord, can we get to the resurrection? That's not the point. What, what are they asking how long for? Yeah, they're, everybody's still down there going through the troubles. How long, O Lord, how long? They're happy where they're at. They're not like, did anybody bring cards? <laughs> You know, I mean, that, that's, are, we, are we there yet? Yeah, right. Are we there yet? Right. <laughs> that was the children's message this morning. I don't know if I pulled that one off very well this morning either because they were all looking at me with blank stares this morning. So, <laughs> Children's message is sometimes a, a hit and miss on that. So hopefully maybe adults got something out of it. Okay. But yeah. Okay. With the, <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> good, good. I'm glad because the, the look of the kids' faces were like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Neither do I. So we're in the same boat. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's not. Are we there yet? It's not. It's it's really. Oh Lord, you, you know they need that rescue too. They need to get. They need to come out of that. They they need this as well. You know that's what the the saints up in heaven are waiting for. But it's not a time thing. I've often wondered the same thing, because you know there is that. And this is all hypothetical, people. So pay attention to this. All right. There is that thought, like when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, who shows up with him? Moses and Elijah. Well, the thought is. That that's Jesus with Moses on Sinai when he's given him the law. Now there's a time and, and eternity thing that blows your mind, doesn't it? Because he surpasses time and eternity. It never lasts into everlasting. Right. right. Exactly. You know, and so he's there with Elijah at the same time. Now doesn't that just kind of blow your mind? But if we're talking about the eternal realm, that's exactly what we're talking about. Now don't get me wrong. Uh, from the very beginning, we have been creatures that do have time marked for us. We said that in the sermon this morning, right? There was evening in the morning, day, day one. In fact, the sun and the moon didn't come till day four, right? That's what, so we, we've always been marked by the time. But notice in, in, in day four, it's when God explains why he did that so that we'd have seasons and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because we're going to be tending a garden and taking care of things. So we know how to do these things. We can understand when things are coming or whatever it is, you know. Uh, that's why he's given us that, that time. But we also never would have been like, oh, great, you know, it's my 600th year. I probably got about 400 left. No, you're, e you're eternal at that point in time. So you're not all – and that's a good point. All of our time is marked by what? The day we – yep. The, well, the day we were born or the day we – Die, right? You know? I mean, look at, I mean, I mean, I mean, if, if, you know, at one point in time, you know, you're like, you're celebrating a birthday when you're, you're little, you're like, ah, oh, like today I got, 
I haven't graduated in kindergarten this year. It was just a, ugh, you know. But by the time you get to the other end of the spectrum, you're like, oh, crud. You know, I'm 70, I'm 80, I'm 90. You know, all you're doing is marking time till you die, right? That won't exist anymore. And the other thing is, you know, the, I mean, in heaven, you know, when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, which, by the way, are the same thing, same space, you know, we won't be given in marriage or taken in marriage. You know, you won't, you know, you won't talk about the day that you're going to pass or getting things. We'll all just be there together, which is really hard to. Well, and so there is no real time because it's always there. Right. But you could but you would almost say then why would man even come up with the theory? Because he's trying to ex explain what God actually is, is that he's eternal. You know. I mean that's really that's really what it is, that we try to even come up with theories of how things exist. Yeah, right. And hasn't that always been the trouble of man? Trying to describe God? Right. I'll tell you who God is. Look at me. That's what, that's the world's idea. You want to know who God is? Look at look at me. All right. What question are we on? <laughs> that's where we'll pick it up next time. Which, by the way, will be two weeks from now. Uh, Pastor Postle will be with you next week here. Of a topic of his choice. <laughs> yep. So be here next week for Pastor Apostle. I think of you know, when you're, you're talking about fear, you know, and you know, symbolizing fear, what, what you're going to be like and so forth. And, and I think, uh, uh, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's, and, you know, and that's why uh, us as Christians. You know, we go to that. We cling to it. Um, but that's also our goal for the world. You know, you have eternal life. And here it is. It's in Christ. And we take that to the world. All right. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven.